Hi everybody, my name is Alan Dipert, and I'll be talking today about JavaScript Assisted Common Lisp, or as I like to call it, Jackal. Jackal is a new Common Lisp implementation that targets the JavaScript platform. My agenda consists of three major topics. First of all, I'd like to set the scene for you to give you a little context and background that could help you understand Jackal and determine whether or not it's something that's applicable to what you do. I find that projects are much easier to understand if there's a if if you have a little background about why that project came to be, what motivated it, what experience experiences led to its creation. And in this part of my talk, I'll hope to illuminate that for you. I'll also talk about the JavaScript platform and why I'm interested in it, what it can do, and what it's not, what it can't do, and um, set the stage technically uh, for Jackal. And then I'll get into Jackal itself, um, its high-level organization, the features that I think are interesting and important, and the parts of it that are maybe speculative. Finally, I'll do a little demonstration, and we can see Jackal in the browser running. And I'll also show Jackal's REPL client facility, which is a, kind of a novel thing about Jackal, uh, because it involves this asynchronous reader that I'll talk about. My road to Jackal began, I think, around 1994. I was learning BASIC at the time, I think Quick Basic, and my dad, who was a, a taught me programming, has been a big inspiration for a lot of things that I do. Uh, after I learned about arrays, he said, Alan, arrays are really cool, aren't they? And I said, yeah, yeah, very cool. And he said to me, you know, there's a whole language oriented around the idea of arrays. And I distinctly remember thinking, wow, that sounds so dumb. <laughs> and I'm sure he laughed a little, scoffed, and brushed aside my absolutely ignorant comment. And uh, I went on to program in a few other kinds of languages. Um, I returned to Lisp in a big way with in 2009 when I learned about Clojure, and I started to use Clojure professionally. And a few years after that, I was involved in an effort to create something called Clojure Script, which was a variant of Clojure that compiled to JavaScript instead of to the JVM but still emphasizing functional programming. ClojureScript was really eye-opening to me in a couple regards. First of all, it was the first time I'd been involved in any kind of compiler development, and I got to see how that was done. That was really interesting. And maybe my uh, abiding memory from that experience is just that, wow, it's, you can, you know, even lowly application developers like myself can benefit from making the right kind of compiler to fit the right kind of problem. It's a great tool to be able to make and to apply. Um, the other thing about it was that ClojureScript from the beginning was really oriented toward industrial application and performance, both in terms of code size and in terms of speed, are really important in the JavaScript world because of various limitations surrounding JavaScript, including the fact that when people run your program, they need to download the whole program every time, uh, usually. And the designer of ClojureScript, Rich Hickey, he made a very, I think, uh, he, he had a very key insight uh, related to code size and in code improvement, which was, it's possible to lean on third-party tools like Google Clojure Compiler to do that part of the compilation pipeline. And the, the advantage of that is you can keep your main compiler quite simple and easy to work on. So fast forward a few years, I did a bunch of industrial closure script development. I used it at work and successfully and continued to do closure. Around 2016, uh, sort of randomly just got into common Lisp. It had been always kind of a blind spot for me in the Lisp world. And I knew Rich Hickey had been influenced by common Lisp before he made Clojure, and I had brushes with it through Clojure, but I'd never really sat down with it myself. And the more time I spent with it, the more I grew to really, really like it. Um, it's, I think, in a lot of respects, lower level than Clojure, but I think that that lower level aspect defers more capability to the programmer. Um, there's more room to make the language of the problem 
as I've heard it called. So as my uh, Lisp fanaticism grew, I had this idea to make Jackal. But there are actually a few other ideas that, that led to Jackal that happened kind of concurrently. Um, at one point, I had the idea to make my own Lisp dialect called Beta Lisp. That was going to be an experimental uh, vehicle to play with this idea that macros receive arguments macro expanded by default. And so the beta in beta list comes from beta reduction, lambda calculus. Uh, I had this idea that that would, you know, dramatically clean up the the Lisp uh, implementation, but it didn't really work out that way. There are other problems associated with that, uh, and I didn't get too far with it. But I did stumble on this idea of an asynchronous reader, which I'll talk about again soon in the talk. Um, at one point, I picked up a copy of Common Lisp the Language, second edition by Guy Steele. And uh, I also read through a bunch of the early Common Lisp design discussion emails and this su-ai.arpa mailing list thing. And that got me interested in, uh, or I think gave me an appreciation for the amount of design work that went into Common Lisp. Um, which was really refreshing to me because I had just failed to design a language uh, and I felt better about failing to do so when I realized how much, how difficult that really was to do. And I realized that implementing a spec is going to, would be a lot easier than, than designing a language, like orders of magnitude. Uh, and at least one reason is if you're handed a spec, you can work on it in pretty small increments and make really gratifying progress over a long period of time and that progress can be continuous but if you're working on a design of a language that's that that's something that requires a, a, a lot more effort so I just started to play with this idea of implementing a common Lisp and I knew I knew common Lisp was huge and that it would probably never be done but I just couldn't help myself and as I got going I realized I had this opportunity to maybe maybe achieve some things with the new common Lisp um, first, I knew that the browser platform uh, suggests a lot of language level ideas to solving various problems. And I thought, you know, if I'm going to be making languages to target JavaScript, what better way to start than with common Lisp as a substrate? Because it's a, it's a known quantity and it's a proven substrate. And I also realized I had an opportunity to pursue this idea of an asynchronous reader because I had a suspicion that with an asynchronous reader, a new level of residential development could become possible, which is to say that the development time and the runtime environments could be integrated in a way that they haven't yet been with any of the Lisp implementations that I'd experimented with. And plus, you can't go wrong if you have, your, have a nice common Lisp to work with. And I thought, you know, if I'm going to be doing browser stuff for the rest of my career, be nice to have a common Lisp that I can I can use so that I can write common Lisp. So the JavaScript platform, which I'm interested in compiling to, and which Jackal is intimately related, um, in a nutshell, it makes the browser programmable. So prior to the advent of JavaScript, the web browsers were effectively static document viewers with some styling capability. JavaScript makes them full-blown programming environments. Uh, that's interesting and important and valuable in, a, in an industrial setting because it makes people feel like web pages are faster. They're not necessarily actually doing work faster, but they're more responsive. Modern JavaScript runtimes are also quite efficient and fast. They have world-class garbage collectors now in Firefox and Chrome, and world-class tracing JITs, really incredible technology. Um, the JavaScript is quite a fast language, even in commodity web browsers. There's a document object model, uh, model abstra abstraction in um, JavaScript, and this is how one presents user interfaces and collects input from the browser. The JavaScript platform is heavily, heavily restricted, and it has severe limitations, and it has those limitations because it's fundamentally for running untrusted code. People have to believe that if they have JavaScript on in their web browser and they go to a website, that the website will not have access to their file, their personal files, and will not be able to crash their computer. So. Um, that's probably the major reason that JavaScript does not have multiple threads, multiple 
any kind of concurrent execution model. It's single process, and it has an event loop, which is to say that uh, inputs can happen in JavaScript, but inputs are enqueued on an event queue, and that event queue uh, can 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 only be consumed by one process, which is the the single JavaScript process. So Jackal brings to bear in the JavaScript arena uh, a few a few different tools. The first set of tools is related to interoperation with JavaScript, and I mentioned some a few special forms here that allow one to call JavaScript functions, access JavaScript object fields, and to generate arbitrary JavaScript code. Um, there are other aspects to this that aren't on the slide, like you know uh, the Jackal numeric type, the fixnum is a JavaScript floating point number. Um, so the relationship there is very tight, uh, and it's actually that tightness is an effort towards efficiency, since I don't need to ship my own implementations of things like fixed nums or flow nums. Um, but that level of integration is also primarily what will preclude Jackal from becoming any kind of, uh, you know, a, a compli conforming implementation. Uh, JavaScript is just too uh, too restrictive for that to ever be possible. Another, the second major aspect of Jackal is that it needs to be able to make small and efficient code. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I want to use this at work someday. It needs to be competitive with whatever uh, language du jour people in, the, in my field are using. And I learned from the ClojureScript experience that I don't necessarily need to be the person who writes those optimizations because I just need to generate JavaScript that other JavaScript optimizers can understand. And this is great uh, as you know an individual contributor. This is my personal project. This means that I can focus on other parts of the, of the code base and defer optimizations to third-party tools, uh, which are excellent. The third thing that Jackal focuses on, which is the most speculative, but also maybe the most interesting, is that I have this idea that there is advantage to doing what has been called residential development. And residential development is a development workflow and sort of ethos characterized by this idea of closely integrating the runtime and the development uh, environments. So the same tools that you use to build your application might be tools that you would use in the application itself. And the line between application and tooling is very fuzzy. Interesting consequences of this include the idea that development tools can inhabit the application through to deployment and even after. Um, Smalltalk and Lisp both historically supported this kind of development. Uh, Although an IDE like a Lisp machine or a small talk environment is not really in my personal scope, that's just a little more work that I'm willing to take on, <laughs> and I'm not particularly interested in doing that. But uh, I, I think there might be an advantage to not precluding that, because whatever tools I develop would converge on an integrated development environment, and I just wouldn't want to make that kind of thing impossible. And in the meantime, I personally use uh, Emacs with a network REPL, which I'll demonstrate. So I mentioned that the asynchronous reader was kind of a banner feature in Jackal, and, and the reason for that is it's kind of the linchpin of the residential development environment workflow experiment. Um, the fundamental problem here is JavaScript's model of input. Uh, in, input can only be consumed asynchronously via callback. So if one were to say consume characters in JavaScript, uh, you wouldn't be able to read new characters from some input source until your code is done running, because there's a single process. Code can only be con uh, objects can only be consumed from the event loop, the event queue, uh, once the stack is empty. So there's no blocking, which means that the straightforward traditional approach to a Lisp reader is not really uh, effective, because you can make a Lisp reader in the traditional style but it will block everything else in the browser tab, and your program can be deadlocked easily. So in Jackal, what we do is we have an asynchronous reader abstraction, which is a, it's a stateful object. You instantiate one of these asynchronous readers, and 
it has a method for pushing characters into it. And every time you call the method uh, and push characters internally, incrementally, it parses. So it's an incremental, it's an online incremental parser. And when it's accumulated a data structure, whether that's a list or a symbol or whatever, it will invoke a callback with that data structure. So um, next up is a demonstration and I'll show interaction in the browser and what you other sort of what it looks like to run Jackal in the browser and I'll show the integration with JavaScript and we'll show the asynchronous reader and then I'll show what the development experience currently looks like using this Jackal REPL client connecting to a remote browser and evaluating Okay, we are back now with a demonstration. So over on the left-hand side here, we've got a terminal open, and I'm running a local web server on port 8000 from the Jackal distribution directory. And on the right-hand side, we're looking at the Jackal tests, um, which are just basic tests of Jackal, uh, woefully incomplete. But the important thing about the browser on the right is that Jackal's loaded into it. And we can actually interact with Jackal through the browser's built-in development tools. And I'll show you how that's done here. I'll make this font a little bigger. So I happen to know that there is the moral equivalent of an input stream set up in this browser ready to receive characters from us. Now, of course, this console here is a JavaScript console, but we can write JavaScript code that pushes characters into the compiler's reader or the REPL's reader. And I think it's called REPL input stream. So we can do REPL input stream dot write each, which will take a sequence of characters, and we can send it just the number one, two, three. Cool. Um, The killer feature of the Jackal REPL is that it's incremental. So when we sent the characters one, two, three with a terminal space, it read the token. But because this is an incremental parser, we can send it characters one at a time and it will digest them and only uh, read, compile, and evaluate when an entire token or an entire datum has been accumulated. Um, a list is, of course, the best demonstration of this. So make a list here with just one and two. Oh, I better quote it. And then let's send in three. Let's see the effect. Now, we sent in a list, which you can see gets evaluated, compiled, or compiled and evaluated as a cons type object. And we can inspect that object using the JavaScript object inspector. So you can see it has two slots, car and cutter. The cutter is a cons with 23. And then the car of that, excuse me, the cutter of that second cons is null. So it's a, pro a proper list. We can also read symbols. So let me read a symbol and the symbol can be our entry point into the package system. Oh, of course, it's not done reading that symbol because I have to send it some white space. But when it did, you can see we get a symbol back. And you can see that there's a lot more going on with symbols than with consas. And plus here is refers to the plus from the common Lisp user package. Uh, so you can see that we're in an environment where the CL package has not been referred. Um, you can see some metadata here that's interesting to the, the runtime, like whether it's constant, a macro, special variable. And yeah, you can see the stack field here. This has to do with supporting dynamic binding. Okay, so that actually wasn't as interesting as I had hoped. So let's use a different runtime facility to look at the all of the packages that are loaded. So I think I can do packages. So I, that's a JavaScript global variable called all caps packages. And you can see that it contains 
many entries, including Jackal, JS, Common Lisp, and then some aliases. A keyword package, of course. Let's drill into the Common Lisp package. You can see the list of exports and all of the symbols that are interned in there. So if we can find a symbol that's a function, like not, okay, we can see that's a value, the list symbol is the value, and it has an f value. So this is a symbol with a function slot of, or an f definition of a particular function. And that function is a JavaScript function. And so we could actually right click here to store as global variable. And now in the JavaScript environment, we have a handle to this function. And you can see it's a compiled function. Um, and let's call it. So if we call it with null, it returns true. If we call it with true, it returns null. So all of this is to demonstrate that Jackal functions are JavaScript functions. Uh, you can see here that uh, the Jackal function does some argument length checking, which JavaScript does not do by default. Okay, enough tinkering in the browser. Let's do some stuff from Emacs, because it's not a real Lisp until you're doing stuff from Emacs, right? So flipping over to Emacs here, um, these are the Jackal tests. Actually, all this, this test result screen here is uh, run um, as a consequence of this code running. I just had this open just to show some Jackal code. But we want to start a REPL. And the way we can do that is with the Jackal tool that ships with the Jackal distribution currently. So this browser on the right-hand side is, I, I started it with the proper uh, command line flag to turn on remote debugging. And the Jackal REPL tool leverages the fact that the browser is effectively a server, and it connects to that server in order to send it data characters. So to start this up, I do uh, in Emacs, I can do control U meta X run dash Lisp. And instead of the Lisp command, I'm going to give it the Jackal command. And this is actually hosed in some way. Oh, right. Because we have a dev tool session over here, we can't start a new one over in Emacs. So I'm going to reboot this. Then I'm going to use a shortcut I have in Emacs called Jackal REPL. Just a little list function, e list function. Okay. Now, over in the Emacs side, we're connected up to the browser on the right hand side. So I can do stuff, but you're not really seeing it take effect because um, evaluating the number 1, 2, 3 doesn't do anything in the browser. But we can use the Jackal special forms to do things like call the alert function to produce a box in the, on the browser. So let me do, uh, well first, let me go down to the Jackal tests file, and I'm gonna evaluate this to enable some of the reader macros for JS syntax. So we're interested in the alert function, and I'm gonna reference it here from Jackal. You can see the REPL does not pretty print stuff, and uh, it's just basically spewing the JavaScript textual representation of things. But that at pipe reader macro is a way for us to access global variables. So we can do, um, we can use the, the, well, there's a couple ways we could do this. We could use jackal call and pass it a topic or a function, the alert, and then let's pass it a JavaScript string. Boom. Cool. Uh, we can use a little more sugar to do something like that. Oh, I didn't like it. Oh, I think I know. Hmm. Well, something might be broken there. Anyway, more work for me to do, but uh, this concludes the demo, and uh, I thank you very much for your time, and I hope you learned something from my presentation. I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you very much.